I'm Naomi Oreskes and I work at the University of California, San Diego. And this particular piece of work is about scientific reticence to really talk about dramatic and worrisome and potentially alarming results. So it's a kind of analysis. It starts from the question of whether or not scientific predictions about climate change have been exaggerated and alarmist. It's based on some empirical work we did that shows that that accusation is not true, that if anything, scientists have actually been overly cautious, that earlier predictions in the IPCC have under-predicted uh, a number of significant climate drivers and impacts. And then it gives a kind of cultural and intellectual analysis of why scientists may have underestimated the threat of climate so change. What we're proposing is that the core values of science, the core values of the scientific community, rationality, objectivity, dispassion, restraint, moderation, actually introduce a bias into scientific evaluation in cases where some possible outcomes are in fact dramatic. And that when scientists encounter outcomes that are potentially quite dramatic or even potentially alarming, that it actually makes them uncomfortable. And they have a tendency, and I would argue probably subconsciously, to emphasize the more cautious range of their data, uh, erring on the side of least drama, erring on the side of the data that seems less dramatic and less alarming. And the argument of the paper is that this is really a problem, that this is actually a source of bias in scientific information. It's an obstacle communicating clearly about the full range of possible impacts of climate change. And it's caused us, I think, I would I argue, it's actually caused us to underestimate the threat uh, rather than to overestimate it. And that's what triggered the study in the first place. So because I had my previous work was about the whole phenomenon of climate change denial and doubt mongering, I knew that we in the scientific community, myself included, were constantly being accused of being alarmist. And yet when I went to scientific meetings, when I listened to the discussions and also based on my own work in the previous previously in the history of science, it just struck me that that assertion seemed hard to believe. It just didn't gel with what I knew about the scientists that I know, their personalities, their manner of operating, and also what we know from the history of science. So it struck me on the face that that claim of alarmism seemed unlikely, but it's not enough to say that it seems unlikely. You need to do work. And so we undertook a, a study to look at uh, the scientific literature to see cases where we had evidence, where we had comparisons, where we had data, where we had earlier predictions and we could look at those predictions and say, well, how did those predictions fare? And what we show, we, there were six major studies that we found that we would have looked at. In every single one of those, we, we find data that shows that scientists have either got it right or have underestimated the drivers and impacts, and not one case of where scientists have actually overestimated the drivers so and impacts. So I think that we are seeing that climate scientists are becoming a little less hesitant to discuss these issues of extreme events than they were even a few years ago. But still, I think there is a lot of hesitation in the scientific community for exactly this reason. Because, as I said, the cultural values of the scientific community are not to be dramatic. I think that we actually, we blame it on the science. We say, oh, well, there's all these uncertainties and probably distribution functions, and you know, you can never say that any one event is caused by blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, you know, we know a lot about the drivers. We know a lot about the physics. We know a lot about the chemistry. We know a lot. We have a lot of statistical data about the relationship between drought, heat, and fire. So we know a lot about these topics. So what is it that's stopping us from speaking clearly and effectively about that? And I think, yes, scientific uncertainty sometimes is part of the issue, but I think there's a whole other cultural and social and emotional affective domain that we don't really talk about for the same reason, because as scientists we don't know how to talk about the affective domain. So we brush it aside and we don't pay attention and we act as if it doesn't matter, but in fact it matters tremendously. When I talk about the affective domain, we're talking about affect. It's about the things we feel, things we feel in our heart, things we feel in our gut, the things that make us worry, the things that make us anxious, the things that make us fear, and also conversely, the things we love and care about. Climate change isn't just about fear and anxiety, it's also about protecting the things we love. But again, how many scientists do you know are very good at standing up in public and talking about climate science as a labor of love? I think that when climate scientists speak to the public, you know, outside the realm of scientific meetings, they have to speak as human beings. They have to allow themselves to speak from the heart. Because scientists are people, scientists do care about the world they live in, and many of them do the work they do because they care about the natural world, because they care about their neighbors, uh, because they care about the human impacts of climate. You know, this isn't just about polar bears, right? This is about impacts on us here and now, our fellow citizens, 
here in Colorado, in Texas, nearby, in California. So I think we need to communicate that. And I think if we do, our fellow citizens will understand this problem much more effectively.